Hey viewers, Fernando from SkyFi Audio. Today is Friday, May 20th. It is precisely 4.25 p.m. and that is in fact a Rolex Kermit, it's a Mariner. Um, today I'm gonna dive into our cartridge selection. Um, we chose many years ago Sumiko to be our premier cartridge supplier. Did a lot of research in the industry, tried a lot of different brands, and really zoomed in and focused on what we felt uh, was the best brand, the best value, and the wider selection to fit 99% of our turntables. So if you go into our website, you can find any of these cartridges. And we also, if you buy a turntable from us, we have a pull-down menu on most listings that allows you to select a cartridge. But at the same time, we make a specific recommendation for a turntable mostly from experience and price point. Um, certain cartridges work well with certain tone arms, and um, you also kind of want to stay within a realistic range. You don't want to put a $2,000 cartridge on a $400 turntable. So we try to help uh, viewers or mm, audiophiles uh, with what we feel is the most appropriate cartridge for that turntable. But a lot of times, uh, viewers will also choose up and down the range. Uh, they might say, well, what is the next step up from there? Or, well, it's a bit of out of my price range. Where do I go from there if I want to spend a little less? And in cartridge selection, a bunch of things go into, into effect, or, or a, there's a ton of critical points to consider. And one of them that isn't talked about very often is how delicate a cartridge is. Um, if an audio file, or let's say uh, somebody new to vinyl calls up and orders an LP12 from us or a Rega turntable, my first question is often, well, have you had a turntable before and how careful are you? Do you have pets? Do you have kids? Do you have a cleaning lady? What is your sort of living situation? Because what I hate to see the most is someone buy an expensive, delicate cartridge and ruin it in the first week. So oftentimes I will actually talk a client down from let's say, uh, you know, a songbird to maybe, a, you know, blue point number three, just because of experience and likelihood of damage. Um, some of these cartridges, once you destroy the stylus or the cantilever, there's really no recourse. Um, and there are some that allow you, uh, for example, most of the Oyster series does allow you to change the stylus without having to discard the entire cartridge. So anyway, what I've assembled here today is most of what we, uh, elect from the Sumiko uh, lineup. Um, we've discarded a few at the bottom end that we don't bother with, uh, mostly. Uh, I think there's a Pearl and a few other models. So we started the Rainier at the bottom of the, of the pool and worked our ways up all the way up to the Palo Santo. And we are missing a couple here and we have one extra as well. So out of the collection here, we're missing the Wellfleet, which is the second from the top of the Oyster series. And then we're also missing a Celebration 40, which just sold. So, but still, we've got most of the good stuff right here. I'm gonna go through cartridge by cartridge, kind of talk about uh, initially sort of what to look for, what are important uh, measurement points and important design considerations, what works well with what type of tone arm, uh, what are the appropriate price ranges, how to match it to a preamp. So I'm gonna take a pretty deep dive into the world of cartridges. So hang in there, it's gonna be a while. I figure this is gonna be a 20, 25 minute video, um, but I've, I've done quite a bit of work in, in preparing for this. I've got copious notes, I made a spreadsheet with the real vitals about all these cartridges. The, the one thing that you did notice when you go online is that it's really hard to compare A to B to C. So what I did is I've created a spreadsheet here, which I will share um, in the link below with the vitals. You know, price, technology, kind of uh, cantilever, kind of stylus, output voltage, um, et cetera. They're really important key things and I've eliminated all the other noise. Um, this is in fact my turntable calibration bench. This is something I built a couple of years ago. Uh, this is where I calibrate turntables. I've got all the necessary equipment here, including a drawer full of the most important calibration tools. We do go through a 12 step calibration process on the higher end turntables if you buy one from us. So I thought it'd be appropriate to do it on the calibration bench. Um, I've also set up a microscope here. This is the inspection microscope that we use. I mounted a camera to it. I got my phone connected to it. I'm gonna actually show you some of the, the cantilevers on, and stylus on the, on the cartridges. I've got my computer fired up and, uh, and notes as I mentioned. So 
Before I dive in, I've got a lot of my information from Sumiko themselves. They've got a fabulous website at sumikophonocartridges.com. And there's a there's a often overlooked document in there called the Cartridges 101 that really dives deep into uh, design considerations and, and critical uh, features of each cartridge. I encourage you, if you've got 30 minutes to read this, I got a lot of my information from here as well as the many years of experience in the industry. So uh, sumikophonocartridges.com, I will link to this on the video as well. All right, so diving in. So the importance of a cartridge is often overlooked. People will spend tons of money on the speakers, amplifier, preamp, cables, all this stuff, and then cheap out on the cartridge, which is really a shame. Uh, I've always sort of endorsed the fact that the most important components in a stereo from top to bottom, one is the speaker, second is the room, third is the cartridge. And, you know, number two and number three could be interchanged. Uh, a room can be as important as a cartridge and vice versa. And that's because that's the, the signal path is essentially, or the music is generated by the contact of the stylus with the record surface. It's really almost like a microphone. So you can imagine the importance of a microphone in a complete music chain, just like the other end of the extreme, which is the speaker where the, the sound emanates, right? And of course the room, the effect of the room on that speaker. Those are the real three key points. So maybe take a look at your budget and spend a little bit less on cables or maybe on the preamp and, and really spend on, on the cartridge where it really, really matters the most. Next, we're gonna talk about the anatomy of a cartridge and what each little bit is referred to. So the entire assembly is the cartridge um, and we're gonna start with the body. The body is the housing that holds all the critical components. Um, this particular one from Sumiko is made out of aluminum. They come in all different metals, exotic woods, even minerals. I've seen some stone uh, bodies as well. So its primary function is just to hold everything together. We've got the four connectors in the back for left and right channel, plus and minus. This is very common, obviously, in all cartridges. Uh, from then, we go on to the cantilever. The cantilever is this tube assembly right here. It's essentially the, the rod that holds the, the stylus to the, to the body itself. Uh, those come in all different types of materials. Some are hollow, some are solid. Aluminum is very common. Um, as, as so are like um, boron, etc. So they'll vary depending on the price range, but it's essentially what transfers the energy between the stylus and the and the motor itself. So at the end of it, and the most critical component is obviously the stylus. The stylus is a, is, a, is a generally a gemstone, often diamond, in a very specific cut, and those cuts will vary throughout different cartridges and, and through the price range. The size, the cut, and the placement um, is what determines the overall quality or sound of a cartridge. It's the most critical component. It's also fairly important that it be done right so it doesn't wear out the record surface or wear itself out. So um, we'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, lastly, we've got the suspension. The suspension is typically not visible it's inside, it's what sort of dampens the movement of the cantilever. It's often made out of some sort of elastomer, a plastic or a rubber. And it's essentially a suspension system, much in like a car that allows the stylus to move uh, coherently and return to its center point. So as the you know cantilever tracks the surface of the record, the suspension's responsible for keeping it all in place and bouncing back to dead center. From there, we've got the generator. That's generally a magnet structure with the coils. So essentially what creates, uh, what turns mechanical action into electrical force. So it's um, almost always a, a coil, a wire coil around some sort of armature uh, and then excited by a magnet. And that's uh, the, that particular design is what changes between moving magnet and moving coil. And I'll go a bit more into that later. Um, and um, I think that's it for the, for the naming convention. 
Now let's dive a little deeper into each of the components we just discussed. So first and foremost, the stylus. Stylus come in, in different shapes, materials, and sizes. Um, and that'll depend whether it's moving coil, moving magnet, whether it's made for a 78, for a 3345. And um, it's part of the magic of the cartridge maker is to, to design the stylus cut and figure out what works best with their body and their cantilever and their entire assembly. Um, common types, let me show you a picture of, of what the stylus looks like zoomed in. Um, here are you know, three or four different types. We've got uh, elliptical, which is the most common. We've got micro ridge, type three, spherical. Um, they come in, you can see quite a bit. And, and what's important about them is that that is the point in contact between the cartridge and the records. So how compliant it is, how capable it is of following the groove has to do with its shape, size, etc. Now they also have to be incredibly durable so that they don't wear out. That's why they often use precious stones and uh, they have to be light and fast. Um, if we look at the Sumiko lineup, for example, uh, at the top with the Oyster series working down to the reference series, they used mostly elliptical um, in the Oyster series moving onto a line contact at the amethyst, the top of the moving magnet. And then in the reference series, it's mostly elliptical until you get to the three highest levels, which are marker ridge, stylus. Um, so, you know, why is this so critical? Well, it has an incredibly difficult job to perform. Not only does it have to follow a very fast moving uh, record surface, and I mean fast, it's, it's moving, let's say, at the outside of the record where you have the highest record velocity. It's moving at almost 20 inches per second and down to about eight inches per second when you get towards the middle of the record. So it's going so fast and believe it or not, that speed generates a ton of friction, which results in uh, temperature. So uh, I was surprised in the document from Sumiko to read that you know, the typical tip temperature can be as high as 300 degrees while the record surface is at melting point is only at 500 degrees. So you can just imagine. And why does it generate so much heat? Because it's such a tiny little thing and it's the record surface is passing by at such a high speed. If it was much bigger, it had a bigger contact area, then it'd be maybe dissipated and be able to handle heat better. But no, it's, it's pretty high. And then the force itself, um, because it's such a small surface, uh, even though the tracking force is only a couple of grams, it actually generates, you know, close to four tons per square foot. And again, that's a result of it being such a small surface area. So pretty, pretty hard job for it. Um, now the cantilever, which is the rod that holds the stylus, it needs to be pretty low mass. It has to be super stiff um, and has to be able to just manage resonance. Uh, or have to have as little, be as inert as, as possible so that it does not have any effect on, mm. any negative effect on the, on the movements. Um, common materials are aluminum, boron, sapphire, or even ruby. They, have, they, they make uh, cantilevers of all different um, shapes, you know, diameter, some are hollow. Uh, they come in all, all different variations and that'll depend on, again, moving coil versus moving magnet and the design intent. Uh, we talked about the suspension made out of elastomer. Um, it needs to allow, you know, free movement. It needs to dampen the cantilever and it, it needs to eliminate any micro jitters or anything that's being uh, generated. Um, the compliance, in other words, how malleable it is, is measured in CU units, which are compliance units. Uh, the higher the, the unit, the more compliant, and the lower the unit, the stiffer it becomes. And you'll see compliance uh, listed in just about every cartridge. Uh, here it is, for example, from top to bottom, all the way through the cartridge range. Now, that's important in terms of uh, how well a cartridge is gonna do with the tone arm. So you'll, talk, you'll hear people discuss about what the compliance is of a cartridge as how it relates to uh, its performance with a specific tone arm. Now, let's talk about the, the generator. In other words, what creates the electricity, right? We're turning mechanical motion into electricity. Um, and that is done through a coil and a magnet. And I found a great illustration online to share with you uh, that really illustrated it well. And let me show you. So here is a moving coil um, 
system up top. We've got the cantilever and the stylus here, the little tip at the bottom. Uh, and what you'll notice is that the coil itself, the you know the, the copper windings that go through a coil are attached to the cantilever so that as the cantilever moves the coil moves with it and it's going to move in both directions up down left and right and this magnet structure in this case it's sitting at the top negative and positive is what is generating the electricity through the wire so you see the copper wires enter here and exit there in other words we're moving the coil through a permanent magnet structure now what does that mean? It means that this is, the system is going to generate very, very low voltage. And that's why moving coil systems require very specific phono preamps because we have to take a tiny, tiny little signal as low as you know, half a millivolt and amplify it. While a moving magnet uh, system, um, you've got the cantilever attached directly to the magnet. So we're actually exciting a magnet. We're actually we're moving a magnet and the coil is stationary. Um, now. This is able to generate quite a bit more voltage, you know, in the order of up to, you know, five millivolts. Um, but it's got some negative side effects, right? You can imagine that moving the magnet, the magnet has to be a very specific size for this to work. So moving a magnet and moving it quickly and exciting it properly is a lot more difficult than it is to move a very lightweight coil structure, as you see in the moving coil. So it's a trade-off. Right, and it's uh, it's why we have both technologies out there after so many years. You know, most manufacturers are still making both types. Now, move ma moving coil tends to be more expensive because it's much more difficult to to work with this tiny little coils attached to a cantilever. Um, also, uh, they're not fix. You can't fix them once you break a cantilever. Generally, in a moving coil, it's since this is permanently attached to it, it's very difficult to repair or do any sort of uh, work on them. While moving magnet systems often are removal. If you can kind of picture, we can pull the cantilever with a magnet out and replace it with a new one. Uh, as long as we don't mess around with the suspension or as long as the suspension is part of the system, then we can actually field replace a damaged moving magnet. And that's what we see. If we go back to our Sumiko lineup in the Oyster series, the entire Oyster series from Renewal all the way through Amethyst uses the same body, the cartridge body itself and they all have replaceable stylus, which is super cool and great for beginners specifically, as I mentioned earlier in the video, where it's nice to be able to, you know, have a mulligan, you know, you mess up your cartridge, you're not starting all over again, you can just replace the stylus. And it also gives you a really neat upgrade path. It lets you sort of go through the entire range. You know, let's say you've got a Moonstone and you mess it up, and you're like, you know what, I think I'm now ready for an Amethyst. You can actually purchase just the Amethyst stylus by itself and install it into a Moonstone. So huge plus there. So speaking of voltage, well, here's a great illustration of, of the variance of output voltage between moving coil and moving magnet. Again, the top grouping is all moving magnet and you'll see that um, the least expensive cartridge has the highest output at five millivolts. And as you go down the range, you end up with the amethyst at two and a half millivolts, which is on the low side for a moving magnet. Now, why do they do that? Well, part of it is because the lower the voltage, the better the frequency response and the less, the less distortion we're going to have. So what they're expecting you to have is, is a better phono preamp as you go up the range, right? So the client with the Rainier is likely to have a, a less or more inferior phono preamp than a client with an amethyst. So uh, hence a different output voltage. And then when you get into the reference series, you know, we, we'll talk a bit about some of the confusion here. There are, in fact, some high output. Um, moving coil cartridges. They've been able to do that over the last couple of decades where both the Blue Point number three and the Songbird come in a high output version, which is two and a half millivolts, which is great for um, in case you only have a moving magnet preamp. And then you see that the real high end stuff has only half a millivolt of, of voltage. So um, I think this will kind of help clear things up a bit. Um, so summing up moving coil versus moving magnet, this is a great article here. Uh, so in moving magnet cartridges, our advantages are in fact high sensitivity or high output level in millivolts. The stylus is easy to replace. They're robust. They tend to be hardier uh, and they're more affordable, you know, less expensive to manufacture. The weak point, a variable re response consistency and high distortion. And by high distortion, let's take that with a grain of salt. The, Modern cartridges have pretty low distortion, even at the moving magnet level. 
Uh, moving coil, the advantages are very low distortion, excellent transient response, good dynamic range, good tunnel balance, soft sound with lots of density. So they tend to sound better. The weak points, very low output, requiring a much, much higher end phono preamp. The stylus generally cannot be replaced, and they are, in fact, much more expensive, two, three, four, five times. And that's what I'm going to dive into next, is the, the types of uh, cartridges and, and how they differ. So starting from left to right, um, this is uh, part of the Oyster series. This is a Rainier uh, moving magnet. Uh, the first level of cartridges in the Oyster series are all moving magnets. And I'll get a little bit more towards the end as to what the difference is between moving magnet and moving coil. But anyway, at the entry point, in our selection, there are cartridges in Sumiko's lineup below the Rainier, but where we start this video is, uh, is about $150. Um, the mass is about 6.5 grams. It uses an elliptical stylus and an aluminum pipe. And that is common through the first two, both the Rainier and the Moonstone, which are sitting right here. The Rainier starts, I said, 149 and for 50 bucks more, you get a Moonstone. Now the output is a little bit lower and you'll notice that the output goes down as we go up in price. And what does that mean to you? It means that you've got to have a preamp capable of doing low output. So the least expensive phono preamps will handle high output the best and an inverse to that is as you go up in, in the range of cartridges, you end up with a lower output, you need a much better phono preamp. And that's an important consideration as well as that not all preamps can handle all these cartridges. You've got to be mindful of it. You know, most preamps will either do moving magnet and then the better ones will do both moving magnet and moving coil. Now, a good way to understand what you have is to look for settings. To go to moving coil, you're going to have to have some settings, some adjustability. If you don't have specific trim buttons and knobs and switches for your phone section, chances are your capabilities are limited to moving magnet. Now, it doesn't mean you can't have a moving coil preamp. I'm sorry, a moving coil cartridge. It just means you might need an, an additional box or a piece of equipment to be able to amplify it. So, Rainier, Moonstone, differences are not just in price, but in output. The output goes from 5 millivolts to 4 millivolts. And uh, the mass stays at 6.5. The cantilever is an aluminum pipe. And the stylus is a... Uh, 0.3 by 0.7 elliptical. And you'll notice that that also happens in the next step up, which is the amethyst. So the amethyst is the exact same stylus, cantilever changed to a slightly smaller aluminum pipe at half a millimeter. And the frequency response improves a tiny bit as you go up. So 149, 199, $300, 5, 4, and 3 millivolts. So they get a little bit quieter in terms of output, uh, and the performance goes up steadily, as you can see by the frequency response. It's gone from 15 hertz at the low end to 12, and from 25 kilohertz at the high end to 30 and then 33. So a nice little increase in performance between these three here. Um, I am missing the Wellfleet, which is a brand new cartridge that just came out, and that uses a new elliptical stylus and uh, the same pipe as the amethyst. So you can consider there are four cartridges in this range. And the beauty of these range is that you can actually uh, upgrade them by just removing the stylus itself or the, the stylus assembly and changing between. So the body in the first four is the same and you can upgrade them as you see fit. And also you can upgrade them if you break them. You know, let's say you get a really good use out of the Moonstone and you wear it out or your cat jumps on your turntable and breaks it. You can now take the same body and purchase maybe the Amethyst or the Wellfleet stylus and insert it into the cartridge. So these are serviceable by you and it's a real easy swap. Um, moving up the range, we get into the uh, reference series and the reference series really starts over here in the rear. So we've got the Blue Point Special Evil 3, which is actually this might have not be a part of the reference, but this one's been discontinued. This was a huge hit. It sold really well. I still had one kicking around, so I thought I'd throw it into the mix. It's an exposed body cartridge, Evil 3, uh, no longer in production, but there might be some places that have some old stock. 
I'm going to put it aside for today, just so we don't confuse things. All right, so moving into the reference series. The reference series starts with the Sumiko uh, blue point number three in both high output and low output. And this is a new thing. We didn't have this before. The, uh, the old version of the blue point uh, was only available in high output. But this time, as they revised it, they came out in high and low output. So what does that mean? It means that you might be able to connect a moving coil cartridge to a preamp that cannot typically do moving coil to a preamp that is really designed for moving magnet. And that's a really nice perk. So they've figured out how to create a moving coil cartridge with enough output to be used in a moving magnet preamp. And that's what we see here. We see that the difference between the blue point number three high and the low, it shoots between 0.5 millivolts to 2.5 millivolts. And you'll notice that 2.5 millivolts is comparable to a moving magnet output of 2.5 millivolts as we see in the amethyst. So killer cartridge, a great price at 500 bucks. This is a common supplied cartridge to a lot of OEM manufacturers. You'll see a lot of the turntables being sold today will come with this cartridge uh, because it's such a great price performance. So if you want to dabble into moving coil at a moving magnet budget, that's the way to go. Um, it uses a 0.3 by 0.7 elliptical stylus and an aluminum pipe. And the frequency response is a tad worse than the amethyst, but it is in fact a moving coil, so that's usually worth it. Um, we didn't talk about the vertical tracking angle, which is essentially the angle between the, the cantilever and the record surface, and that's going to vary throughout the range. Uh, it's an important measurement point that people often overlook, but we pay close attention to in calibrating turntables. And you'll see that the Oyster series typically is around the 25 degrees, while uh, the reference series goes to 20 degrees. So we actually measure that carefully when we set up a high-end cartridge and make sure that we're in the ballpark. All right, so that's the uh, blue point number three high output. I'm going to move on from there. And the next step up is the Songbird at $900. This is a sweet spot. It's the newest um, open body high output moving coil cartridge. And that is it right here. That also comes in two outputs, high and low. So just like the number three, uh, the high output lets us use it with moving magnet phono preamps at two and a half millivolts. Now, if you want the capacity for moving coil, you can go to 0.5 millivolts with the low output, which is recommended always. Now, the mass goes up, and it goes up as the lightness of the cantilever goes down. The mass of the body tends to go up. So we're already at eight and a half grams for this cartridge. So you have to start being careful when you get over uh, seven grams that your tone arm can, in fact, accommodate it. Some of the, the vintage tournaments in particular um, don't have enough weight to counteract and set the right tra tracking force for some of these heavier cartridges. So at eight and a half grams, it's on the high side, but it's a beautiful piece. You can see the uh, aluminum body exposed uh, generator. And you can see the copper wires as well within the structure. So the thing to keep in mind is that the high end um, reference series, once you get above the blue point, they tend to be a little bit more delicate. If you've noticed on the blue point, the cantilever is kind of protected by the body itself. So if you slam the cartridge down, the torn arm down on your record surface, um, it'll eventually bottom out and it'll sort of protect itself through the plastic on the case. While on the songbird and above, the cantilever sticks out of the front of the motor assembly. So it is much more prone to bending and breaking. So um, this uh, songbird is where the more delicate lineup starts. All right, so at 900 bucks, that's a really nice sweet spot. And I'll talk a little bit later about price of the cartridge versus price of the turntable, because you kind of want to be in a, within a certain range. So um, I mentioned the stylus is still a 0.3 by 0.7 elliptical. And now we've moved up to a, a treated aluminum pipe. So it's a little bit upgraded of uh, aluminum pipe at 0.5 millimeters, uh, comparable to the amethyst. Frequency response goes up in the high end. Now we're at 40 kilohertz. Now we can't hear that high, but it gives you an, a representation of the cartridge's performance. When you see a really high frequency response, 
it means that they sure got the shit together. They have really figured out how to get the most out of this uh, stylus cantilever combination. 20 degrees is the vertical tracking angle. So that's the songbird high and low. From there, we go up to the starling. All right, so again, it's an open body configuration. Uh, it's a, what, what's considered an audiophile grade cartridge in moving coil only. So um, it's only low output. So you've got to have a preamp, a phono preamp that can handle moving coil cartridges of low output at half a millivolt. Now mass goes up again at nine and a half grams. So it's a pretty heavy cartridge within the lineup. So you've got to be careful that your tone arm can handle that. And then we've got a change in stylus. Now we're up at the um, solid ultra low mass 75 micrometer by 2.5 micrometer micro ridge which is this very specific cut and, and material um, and the shaft goes up to boron uh, it's a 0.28 millimeter boron shaft so this is uh, common now from this point up in the lineup um, frequency response goes from 12 hertz all the way to 50 hertz so again a nice step up in frequency response uh, 20 uh, degrees for the VTA as well. So that is $1,800, and that is the Sumiko Starling. All right, we've got two more from there. We got the Celebration 40, which I mentioned I do not have here, but we are happy enough to have a Palo Santo. This just arrived. Um, so now we go into a start slightly different configuration here. Let me put it where you can see it better. All right, so as you can see, the Palo Santo looks completely different than the other cartridges, um, mostly because of the, the housing. It, it is, in fact, in a hardwood configuration. Uh, I assume it's Palo Santo, which is an exotic wood. And it is, in fact, a moving coil cartridge, top of the line, of course, half a millivolt of output. So it's a low output configuration, 8.3 grams in mass, a little bit less than the Starling, but still pretty high up. So you have to be careful with that. Uh, micro ridge uh, stylus, just like the Celebration and the Starling before it. And uh, a 0.28 millimeter boron shaft. And now a frequency response at the low end has dropped to 10 hertz. So we go in a little further, 10 hertz to 50 hertz, kilohertz is the frequency response, even more capable. 20 degrees still on the vertical tracking angle at 44.99 so this is the top of the line from Sumiko I mean, it's a beautiful piece all right so that is uh, the lineup that I've got for you today now we're gonna take a little closer look at at the actual um, stylus cantilever um, so let's see, we covered just about everything in terms of technology. We've covered uh, cantilever, the suspension. Um, I didn't talk about compliance. Um, and I've got this uh, here. Um, this is an important part of matching a tone arm to a cartridge. The compliance here is measured in compliance units. Um, for example, let's look at the blue point number three is a 12 by 10 dash six centimeter dynamic at 1000 hertz um, so this um, this measurement unit is is um, tries to illustrate how a cartridge is going to work with a specific tone arm in terms of its mass so if you look at the specifications in the tone arm and you sort of google the tone arm itself you'll hear people talk about how how it sits in the compliance range in terms of how well the cartridge is going to fit with the mass of the tone arm Okay, so the higher the number, the more compliant it is, and the lower the number, the stiffer it is. Um, the other thing about the suspension, which um, I didn't mention, is that because it's made out of uh, plastic and elastomer, um, the biggest effect on how cartridge is performing is actually temperature, the ambient temperature. Um, if you've got a cold room, that plastic is going to be a little bit harder than in a warmer room. And if you can imagine the suspension uh, as it hardens, uh, the cantilever will have a harder time moving. So um, one thing I did not realize is that in a, in a cold environment, you're not going to get the same performance as you are in, in a warmer environment. So 
you know, if you're in Alaska versus Florida, you might see a performance difference, and you might want to address that if you're trying to get the most out of your turntable. All right, moving on. Um, let's see. So we talked about moving coil versus moving magnet, and what does that mean physically? Well, it, it talks, it's really about how the electricity is generated. Uh, in all cartridges, it's generated by, you know, moving a coil against some sort of magnetic field, uh, and that generates electricity. Um, so in a moving coil configuration, uh, a lot less electricity is being generated than in a moving magnet. And that's, talks, and that's actually the way it's engineered and built. Um, so a moving coil cartridge has a much lower mass. Um, that's how they're able to get a higher frequency response. Uh, the lower mass, while it generates less volume or less electricity, it moves faster and is able to track a record better. A moving magnet that has a heavier magnet um, is, uh, has a lot more resistance for the movement of the cantilever. So uh, while it can generate higher voltage, it's not as fast and nimble through the grooves themselves. And that's really what differentiates the two. So uh, you'll notice that um, a low output is going to be around 0.5 millivolts, while a high output is going to be around 3 millivolts. And that's really the difference between the two. So let me move on and show you a bit uh, under the microscope. All right, now I'm going to attempt to take these uh, cartridges and have a look under the microscope to s illustrate the differences of the cantilever, the stylus, etc. I'm going to start from the bottom. I'm going to start with the Rainier. Um, bear with me. Never done this before. Let's see what kind of results we get from this. Um, I'm not going to use my high quality microscope because the camera isn't that well good on it. I'm going to use this sort of uh, crappy one, but I do get pretty good pictures from it. So here's a shot at the Rainier from the top. Um, you can see the cantilever here. Um, you can kind of tell that it's a hollow aluminum pipe uh, because of the manufacturing process. They, they, they squish down the end of it and then they drive the stylus through it, uh, which is an interesting, easy way to, to make it. You can kind of see the opening at the end of it. I'm going to rotate it now. and get a sense of what the side profile looks like. There we go. Uh, there it is, right there. Pretty good image. So this is in fact an elliptical, uh, 0.3 by 0.7 mils, and it's driven right through the shank. Uh, that's the attachment method. So it's probably a press fit. All right, I'm gonna go grab a different one and show you now I, so that's the Rainier here. Uh, let's go to something different. Let's go to the Amethyst at the top of the Oyster Series range. So that will have a line contact. All right, so here's the Amethyst cantilever. Um, it's hard to tell in this image, but it is in fact smaller than the Rainier one. Same hollow uh, aluminum cantilever, aluminum pipe. And um, the, the stylus in this one is a 0.2 by 0.8 line contact. So let me flip it sideways so you can get a better look at the stylus. Oh, that's a great picture. So here we have it. Um, this is a line contact. I believe it's a nude. You can kind of see that it's not built on a shank. It's a full uh, diamond all the way through its body. So it's, uh, it's shaped out of uh, an entire piece. All right, so this is the amethyst. Now I'm gonna go over and grab, um, let's see what would make sense. The blue point number three is going to look very similar to the Rainier and so on. 
Actually, let's look at a blue point, see if we see anything different on that next. Here's a side profile of the blue point number three. This is the high output version. So it's a 0.3 by 0.7 mil elliptical and aluminum pipe. So pretty similar to uh, both the Vernier of the Olympia and the Moonstone. Here you can see how the stylus is essentially pressed through the aluminum cantilever. It's quite a bit of magnification. That's where all the dust shows, but you wouldn't see that normally to the naked eye. All right, next I'm going to grab, um, let's see, I'm going to grab a, a Starling. Uh, Starling is going to be a low output moving coil design. We should have a micro ridge stylus and a 0.28 millimeter uh, boron shaft. So let me grab that. Okay, quite a bit of a different animal. So you can see the, the thickness of the cantilever is quite a bit smaller. This is a 0.28 millimeter cantilever. And then you can sort of make out at the end of it the micro ridge stylus. Uh, I'll show you a side shot. Before that, let me show you the rest of the body, which is kind of neat. We talked about the moving coil versus moving magnet technology, right? So in here, you can kind of see the shaft goes through a magnet structure, and then it lands. And this is the coils that we talked about. These are the four coils representing the up, down, left, and right movement. And the wire is, in fact, wrapped around the armature of the of the cantilever, which is much different than we would find in a moving magnet, where you'd have a magnet in the place of these coils right here. And then here you can see the suspended suspension material. That's the elastomer we talked about that provides the suspension, which is essentially glued to the stylus. So pretty cool. And I believe this is the magnet structure that the, the uh, stylus is going through. So let me see if I can go up a little higher and give you a broader view. Yeah, a little bit more. So here's the whole thing in one shot. Pretty neat. And the design of this uh, Starling is what allows us to see all the internals. It's an open sort of body design where everything's kind of exposed. And we talked about this before, how if you damage the stylus, you really can't fix it because the entire coil structure is built into it. And you can't just pull it out and replace it with another one. All right, now let me see if I can flip this sideways, show you a side view. All right, here it is. This is the micro ridge um, stylus attached to the boron shaft. You can kind of tell how tiny the stylus is and the attachment method that they used here. And this is what gives the this, for example, cartridge, such a great performance. Uh, the size of the ultra small size of the stylus allows it to reproduce high frequencies much better than a, a larger elliptical or line contact stylus would. So this uh, translates to performance. But as you can imagine, this is a lot harder to manufacture, to get the angle straight, to get the placement just right. I mean, we're talking about half the size of, of the other ones. All right, now we've reached the top of the range. This is the Palo Santos, the flagship low output moving coil. Um, this is gonna have a, a micro ridge stylus with a boron shaft cantilever, just like the Starling. And we'll scan it from left to right so you can see how it's made. We talked about the stylus, the magnet structure, the coils, the elastomer or suspension system and the rest is essentially the body of the cartridge. And then if we go to the top, you can see this is the um, Palo Santo exotic hardwood material. If I go all the way around, you can see it's encased in the wood and here are the, the contact points for the connections. And just to remind you what it looks like, we're looking at this cartridge.
I'm not going to show you the side view because it looks exactly like the Starling that we looked at. And lastly, I want to go back to the Oyster series to the Rainier and show you how the stylus is in fact removable. It's just a press fit and if you do it carefully, you can eject it from the body itself. And as I mentioned, this can be replaced with any of the Oyster series stylus from the range. So you can upgrade this Rainier, for example, to Olympia, Moonstone, Whale 3 or Amethyst. Lastly, I thought it gives some indication of if you don't want to do the research, if you don't want to have to experiment with all this, what should you be buying for your turntable? So one of the quick and easy ways to figure it out is to, uh, to determine the price of your actual turntable. And it's just like everything else in life. You're not going to want to put you know, crappy tires on a supercar, and you're not going to want to put Pirelli P1s you know, on a crappy car. So indication and pricing tends to work fairly well if you don't want to have to experiment a bunch. So I've listed here the table price in this column and I've put in the MSRP of each of these cartridges to give you sort of like a range, right? A $500 turntable, the Rainier would be a great addition to your library. $149 is a great spot. You could always upgrade it later down the road, but it's good price performance for a $500 turntable. If you go down to like a well fleet at a thousand dollar turntable, that'd be reasonable to spend $450 on a cartridge. And then moving down the range, let's say a Songbird high output would be a great match for a $2,500 turntable. And then all the way to the bottom, $12,000 turntable should have a cartridge of around $4,500 to realize their performance. Now I realized that we're not discussing the phono preamp in here, so do make sure that your system is capable of, of delivering the performance that these cartridges can before you jump in. In other words, don't buy a Starling for a $6,000 turntable if your phono preamp can't handle it. Um, so I think this is it. Uh, sorry for the quality of the video. I don't spend a ton of time editing and you know mixing and all that. I try to spend as little time as possible and deliver as much content as I can and not put the effort into uh, camera work and you know integrating images and cuts and all that stuff so this is my best attempt at it I hope you've enjoyed the video all of these cartridges are available in our website at skypyaudio.com please do visit um, you can purchase we have a lot of this Sumiko stuff in stock where uh, we try to stay ahead of it. There's always production delays, but we've always got at least a couple of orders in place to, so we can fulfill orders. And uh, subscribe to our channel if you like what we're doing. Uh, I'd love your support. I would love a thumbs up and uh, a subscription if we've earned it. And um, thanks for watching.